I hope I can think of part two before this is over with. <laughs> Delight to uh, be worshiping with you already. Uh, I can tell you're a worshiping church. Sometimes you go into a church and you wonder, is there a sense of God's presence? Well, I, I think there's a sense of God's presence here in this place. And I'm very, very grateful to have the chance of worshiping with you as our little ones uh, go back to their places. You know, little ones have a way of uh, really kind of centering you. Uh, years and years back now, when I finally completed my doctoral work, my son, who was in about three, uh, was interested in what this meant. And uh, his mother, who was a nurse, said, well, it means that you're probably not going to be called a doctor. And so about uh, a week later, my son was uh, introducing me to one of his little friends, a couple of them. So I said, this is my dad. He's a doctor, but if you're sick, he can't help you. <laughs> well, I'm not really a doctor. Don't pretend to be one. I'm Brother Tommy, and I'm glad to be here with you and experience God's uh, grace and mercy with you and to worship Him. I'm grateful to have Chris here, too. This is the first time I've seen him in action in, in uh, uh, leading congregational work, and I've seen him elsewhere as uh, he has kept us in at uh, Hardin Simmons, I remember the day that we were in my office and we were talking about him coming. And I began to, to, to think about all he could bring to this place and his lovely wife, Rosie, and I've got to know better. And we've, uh, we've got a keeper in, uh, in him, and I'm grateful he can share his talents as well, serving the Lord here in this place. You know, life can get pretty complex, can it? I mean, we can get off center pretty quickly. And one of the questions I've always had is, well, which way are, to whom are we looking? Some of you are starting back to school with your uh, sons and daughters. My wife, my daughter, uh, Carol, is a speech pathologist with her husband, who's in the <coughs> actually, uh, for uh, radiology, and had three children. It looks like a three-ring circus to me. And uh, it gets pretty complex for them as well. But sometimes life gets so complex that we do lose focus, especially when things are changing. And you're beginning to experience some change in this church and perhaps personally as well in, in your lives. Ward been here a long time, I think about a little over 10 years, and uh, I had the privilege of having war in one of my classes when I was at uh, Lawson Seminary, a wonderful pastor and a, a wonderful leader. So you begin to ask the question, you know, well, what's next? Years back, when I was going through a particularly difficult time, in, in my life because some folks that I cared about greatly were struggling. It was about late February and it was evening because the sun had already gone down to pretty pitch black. And my wife said, are you going to take the trash out to get it ready for pickup tomorrow? We lived in Fort Worth at that time. So I remember trudging to get the trash, tying a little bag up, Taking it outside, it almost was like that bag was a, a sort of a bag of my birds. I was really, really hurt. Because some really bad things were happening that could happen more to friends and people in my life. And interestingly enough, as I slipped that bag of trash, really, into the receptacle where it would be picked up the next day, I just happened to glance up. And there I saw for the first time, probably in a long time, that beautiful Texas sky that we see from time to time here in this place. In fact, we see a lot of it out here because we don't have clouds. That makes nighttime beauty very easy. But there was all those stars and all of their beauty, almost as if they were across a velvet satin background, little diamonds. And I really don't know how long I was standing there because Judy finally came out and said, are you okay? And for the first time in a long time, I was okay. And let me tell you why. I want you to turn to the eighth song. This is a song that came to my memory in that moment. This is a song that centered me once again. This is a song that put everything back into perspective for me. And this is a song that David says, tradition tells us, the great king, but who also was, if you remember, a shepherd before he ever became a king. And in the New American Standard Version, these are the words that God gave to David on 
that time long ago, almost 3,000 years ago, that still speaks to our hearts when we find troubles and difficulties afflicting us. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name in all the earth, who has displayed thy splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes thou hast established strength because of thine adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou dost take thought of him, and the son of man that thou dost care for him? Yet thou hast made him a little lower than God, and dost crown him with glory and majesty. Thou dost make him the rule over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fishes of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name in all the earth. When I was a boy, one of the things that my parents gave me was a little small telescope, a little reflector scope, one that wasn't that powerful, but at the age of 11 or 12, it was really a treat for me. So I'd take that little scope out and I would look up into the night sky and begin to realize that not only were there stars that, that could be seen, but there were these other objects out there. I had enough power in that scope to see distant galaxies. Now I began to wonder how big is this place for the first time? How big is the universe? And I was taught in a church, not unlike this one, that God is the one who, who has made all that we can see and even that which we can't see. Now we know, for example, that that particular universe that I was looking at as a boy through my small telescope is infinitely bigger than anything we had ever imagined. We know, for example, now there's not just billions of stars, but there are actually billions of galaxies. Each galaxy con uh, contains over a billion stars. And sometimes as we look into that, that deep space, now we can do go through scopes that are almost unimaginable to 50 years ago and see how vast this universe is. One of the effects of that can, can make us think perhaps we're not all that important, you know. I'm just a little speck on one small planet in the midst of an enormously large place we call the universe. And I think perhaps that's something of what David saw in glimpse. He didn't have a telescope. But perhaps he thought of these thoughts placed on his heart by God as a shepherd boy, perhaps. You know, shepherds don't live a life of excitement, to say the least, but they do live a life of danger. I've spent a lot of my life in the Middle East. Uh, I'm a biblical archaeologist. I used to spend most of my time in Jerusalem and around that area excavating the site. So I know a lot of shepherds. A lot of people who still make their living in that part of the world by tending flocks. And I know that it's a tedious job. But I also know that in the wilderness of the Sinai, which is one of my specialties, it's a dangerous job because there, there are animals there that can snatch away the small sheep and goat or even larger animals than that. So I can imagine that perhaps when David lay his head down for a night's sleep after a long, hot, dusty day, a day in which he may have faced almost boredom for a while, but could have also faced danger at any time, and he wanted to go to sleep. He opened his eyes and looked up. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name, O oh here. And somehow in the midst of that, he began to understand that there is this wonderful, powerful, mighty God who is capable of making and sustaining everything that we can see. But then that drove him to a, a series of questions. Look at verse 3. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, the thou hast ordained. And here's his question. What is man that thou hast take thought of him, and the son of man that thou dost care for him? That's the question. Who is this God who is big enough to not only create all that we can see and beyond our, our physical eyes and to the distant, dim uh, images of 
billions and billions of gallons. And who is the God who can create that and sustain that? And does he care about me? Is he capable of caring about me? He can sometimes feel very, very small. Years back, I was in Cambridge, England, uh, doing some writing and helping the church there on Saturday leave. And so we began to invite some of our friends to come and go uh, to visit us. By the way, you don't know how many friends you actually have until you tell them there's a free place to stay in England. And <laughs> well, on a periodic basis. And we were so grateful for that to see our friends. And I said, the one thing you have to bring is something we are missing from uh, our food pantries. And they said, what's that? And I said, in England, it's salsa, peanut butter, and real dressings. What they call dressings over there are not fit for humans. So, but anyway, it was a salsa, it was a peanut butter. So, it was a pretty cheap gig, you know. You come there, you stay a week or two weeks, and you all, all, only owe us uh, uh, some peanut butter or some salsa. Lots of folks took us up on that. Well, we didn't have a car. We had a brick rail pass and four, four bicycles for G and I and our two children. And so we had to use people ferrying folks back and forth when they flew into London and came up to Cambridge. And we got to know a taxi cab driver who had first taken us up there. <coughs> and in England, you don't talk about things that are spiritual overtly. That's considered impolite. I got to know him pretty well. And we'd taken back some of our friends and we were heading back to, uh, to Cambridge. And we began talking. And he looked at me and he said, Honey, I know that you're a preacher. And he said, I know that you believe in God, and I'll bet you think I don't believe in God. And I said, no, I, I didn't think that you believed in God. But I said, I wonder what you do think. He said, well, I'll tell you what I think. He said, I believe there's a God. He said, I don't believe all of this around us is accidental. But he said, I do not believe this God who has created all this vast universe could care about me, one person, in the midst of all that universe. And it was the moment I've waited for for a long, long time. <laughs> because I said, I know the questions are really tough. How can a God that can do this and sustain all of this care about us? So the truth is, in Jesus Christ, we see a God who calls us by name. We see a God who comes to know us better than we know ourselves and who is delighted to do so. For you see, we are His workmanship. He has put His very best in us. And David began to understand that. He said, look, all of this out there, the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars that you've ordained, the question is, what is man? Who are we that thou dost take out of us? Notice that next phrase, and the son of man that thou dost care for him. That phrase, son of man, by the way, is one of Jesus' favorite uh, descriptions of himself. Son of man. Son of man is nowhere to lay his hands. And in this time, it had two meanings. One, sometimes you could think about a, a being that was beyond humanity, beyond the mortal. You find that, for example, in Daniel. But in Jesus' day, it can also mean just ordinary human beings. And so what is being asked here is, how can God care about the ordinary, about just us, folks? The stunning thing is that when David thought about that question in his own life, God gave him verse 5. Yet, yet, thou hast made him a little lower. And my translation says, than God. Hebrew word there is Elohim. It's one of two words that is used consistently in the Old Testament to talk about God. One is Yahweh. That's God's covenant name. The one that God gave to Israel there on Mount Sinai when Moses asked him, who should I say? sends me back to get your, my people out of Egypt. He said, tell them y'all. And the other is Elohim. The plural of majesty. The name God. Elohim. This is sort of frightening to you. Some of our translations even say a little lower than the angels. And that's another possible translation. But what, what this text is telling us is that God has created us for good things, and he loves us, and he cares for us, and he's invested his life in us. I'm the father of two children, the proud father of two children. And I can tell you after, 
and, and they're now in their 40, and they're now in their 30, <laughs> one soon to be 40, and I expect you to say right now, he doesn't look like a person who's that old. <laughs> so please keep that in mind. <laughs> Although I do look that old, I keep saying in the morning, who's that old guy who gave me in the mirror? And then I run like, that's me. But you know, I'm proud of it. And, and Judy and I have put our lives in. Now, they're not perfect. I can tell you they're not perfect. And neither is the father. But the love is so deep that there's absolutely nothing I would do for my children. You just couldn't name something that I would say, no, I won't do that. If they had a need, I would move heaven and earth to meet that need. I would willing to deny myself to meet that need. And that's what God did for us. We are His children. We're the sheep of His pastor. And when we had the greatest need of all, the need of personal salvation, the need of redemption from our own sins, he said, I can meet that need, and I'm willing to meet that need, and I'm sending my only begotten son, says John, and he's going to die for you that you may live in him for me. And if you ever think that God doesn't care, if you ever think that, that we are so insignificant. Do you ever think that because there's 7 billion and counting people in this world right now, that God doesn't have room to know you by name? Then just look for the cross. The cross is a symbol of God's love writ large. And there God said, this is how much I love you. God didn't tell us how much He loved us. He showed us how much He loved us. Yet Thou hast made Him that is us all of us, people, little lower than God, and does crown us with glory and majesty. Now the truth is we sometimes mess that up, that glory and majesty. But God doesn't stop loving us. He doesn't stop caring about us. He doesn't stop, stop reaching out to us and drawing us close to Him. We can walk away from God, but God will never walk away from us. That's the beauty of His love. It's a tough love. But it's a love that will not let us go. In fact, verse 6 tells us that God loves us so much and gives so much of himself to us that he's given us his creation. Thou dost make him to rule over the birth of our hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fishes of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. God has given us stewardship of all that he because not only does he love us, he trusts us. I mean, anybody that would trust everything that he's created into the hands of someone else must trust that someone else. Now, let's, let's be clear. We're not always trustworthy. I'm not always trustworthy. It's in God's grace. It's in God's mercy. It's in God's love that we find that forgiveness and that newness that truly makes us fit to be called children of God. But the truth is, from the very beginning, God had a plan for your life and for my life. And I will tell you, I could never have scripted my life the way it's been scripted. When I was a nine or ten year old boy growing up in Arkansas, and thinking what I really wanted to be was a geologist or a baseball player, I was a pretty good baseball player. God had a whole different plan. Not that those are bad things. The plan that He had for me was more than it ever. The plan He has for you. Because he knows you by name. The plan he has for this church, because he established this church. We talk about others establishing this church. Human beings establish the church, but it's really God that establishes the church. He moves in people's lives. And he draws them together from all walks of life. And he says, You're going to be a part of my family. And you're going to be a part of my family right here in this place. And you're going to declare my glory and also my love. And that's what you've been doing for all of these decades. And now God is called war to another place to serve them as a pastor, and you're wondering, did he forget about us? And the truth is, God never forgets about anyone or any of his churches. I've had the privilege over many, many years of serving the churches in Brighton to place over 30 times to serve as interims, big and small. They always have the same need to know that God's still going to have a future for us. And in all those churches, Without exception, God's future was more exciting than they could have ever dreamed. You see, because God doesn't somehow go into a state of amnesia 
and call the Lord over here and forget about you any more than somehow he forgets your name in the midst of any day. He knows us by now. He can count the very hairs on our head. If he cares about the birds and the fishes of the sea, and he does, how much more does he care about those whom he's put his very image in? We bear his image. And we don't bear it perfectly. We bear it imperfectly. But Jesus, his only begotten Son, shows us who we were really intended to be. He is our model. Now, we're not divine. But with his strength and because of his grace and through his love, God always has a tomorrow for every one of us. You know, I'll go back to that night when I was burdened. And I've had many of them since, and I expect to have more in the future. Because, you, you know, life is never easy nor without challenges. God never promised me life would be easy. If he did promise me, it would be exciting. And he said, Tommy, I don't want you to just bear it. I want you to live it. It's like he wants you to live it. And I remembered as I thought back on that night when I looked up in the heavens and I saw those stars and they reminded me not only of the vastness of the universe but the closeness of the God who makes that universe and sustains that universe. I remember thinking, without any question whatsoever, if I look in the right direction, there is no reason to fear and there is great. Which way are you looking at? I want to know. Which way am I looking at? I'm telling you. Nobody told me a provost's life is a fix and repair job. <laughs> I told uh, some of my friends when I went from deanship out of teaching for almost 30 plus years in seminary settings in the provost, some of them thought I was completely crazy because it's really a, a place where you can facilitate people and where you can help students as well as faculty achieve their goals. And that's, that's meaningful to me. That's what I want to do. But it's not easy. None of us are called to an easy place. We're called to an exciting place. God is prepared. No churches are called to an easy place. You're called to an exciting place. The question becomes, which way do we look when things get tough as they get every year? Maybe things are tough in your life right now. Maybe there are things that you wish were not there. Maybe it's time that we say together, oh Lord, our Lord. How excellent is your name in all the earth. And then that acclamation of the one who created everything is not too busy to know each of us by name. Our Father, we thank you today. We thank you that in a state like Texas we can look up in the evening sky when the sun has gone down and there arrayed for us in full beauty often. The moon, the stars, the galaxies that now we know are there, even beyond our ability to conceive time and space. Lord, it's a reminder to us of the very one who creates and sustains all of those things is the one whom we are privileged to call by name. Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Redeemer, our Savior. And we know that He walked among us. He knows how we feel. He knows what we face. He knows us from the inside out. He knows us by name. So when we look up in that night sky, remind us that indeed, which way we look makes a difference in how we live. May we be focused upon that one who loves so deeply that He spared not even His only Son that we might live abundantly. And may we be reminded that this great God whom we worship today is also the great God who bends his knees to our needs and supplies in every case all that is necessary, not just to get by, but to live in place and have a purpose and meaning. So I pray today that we'll look up. We'll look up to Him who loves in that way, to Him who has a plan for each of us that is greater than we could ever imagine in our own lives. 
I pray that we'll look up to the one who in our need comes to meet it without reservation and with nothing held back. We come with this time of invitation, Lord, a time when maybe there are people here who have wondered whether or not you care about them that way. Maybe they've wondered whether you can call them by name. Maybe they wonder how you feel about them. May they know through the cross itself that you love us unreservedly, that you call us to yourself that we might find forgiveness through your grace and newness of life. May they come this morning to trust you in a personal way, to put their hands in the very hands of the God who has made all of this universe, that he might be the Lord and shepherd of our own. There may be some, Lord, that need a church home, a place to love and be loved, a place to serve and be served. May they come today and unite with this wonderful fellowship of believers who worship you in spirit and in truth. There may be others, folks, all of us, all other folks, all of us together, perhaps, who are carrying burdens right now in our heart, heavy things that maybe are only known to ourselves, and yet we need some way to release them to the care of a God who loves us like this. May we look to Him. May we look up. May we look fully into His face. Find all that we need. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name.